in a lab setting, measurements are performed using a number of different instruments that can measure the different properties that you can see in a lab. Things like mass, volume, as well as distance and temperature. Each one of these measurements has a different instrument used to measure them. Many times, there are separate pieces of equipment used for the same measurement. In the case of volume, you can measure things very precisely with a narrow graduated cylinder or very, very generally and imprecisely using a beaker. To measure a volume, a beaker should never really be used as it's very inaccurate. It just gives you a general idea of what the volume is. This experiment focuses on measuring a lot of different individual components and then using those to calculate the measured and calculated property of density. In a lab setting, you measure a lot of different things using different pieces of equipment and instruments to measure the exact uh, property. Measuring mass, measuring volume, measuring length, temperature, and even light are things that you can measure in a lab. While many times these uh, pieces of equipment have a digital readout now uh, wh where you can see the numerical value of the measurement. A lot of older pieces of equipment or just general pieces of glassware do not have a digital readout and these pieces of equipment need to be measured using a scale. Just like using a ruler, a scale will have individual numerical values separated by subunit sections, usually in the form of lines or small dashes. In this example, there is a red line drawn all the way through between one centimeter and two centimeters on this scale. The mark is between one and two centimeters. It is more than one centimeter and less than two. On scales, the markings in between are one tenth of the unit itself. Each of these markings is 0.1 centimeters. Moving along the scale, the red, mark, the red line is between 1.6 and 1.7 centimeters. The last digit in a, a measurement using a scale is an estimation. You can read between the scale divisions to give an educated guess as to what the exact value is of this line, what that exact measurement is. You can only really read a scale or estimate to the nearest tenth. It would be very, very difficult for me to say this is a measurement of 1.6288754 centimeters. Impossible for uh, a human to do that just by looking at the scale divisions. But in general, you can be able to, or you're able to read uh, about 10% here or there. My estimation for where I drew this line is at the 1.63 centimeter mark. But again, this is an approximate measurement, that last digit, the three, is somewhat approximate. It could be 1.62, it could be 1.64. The last digit is your educated guess. 
And this is even true in digital scales or digital equipment. Uh, it can only be read to a certain level. The electronics, the computing power can only read it to a certain level where the last digit is the equipment's educated guess. When you're going through and measuring things in the lab, you are measuring a specific property. You are measuring something. And that something would have units associated with it. Uh, typically in lab, you can measure things like distance or length, uh, mass, how much something weighs, the volume, how much space does it take up, uh, the temperature of something, and there are specific units that are associated with these types of measurements. In science and in chemistry, uh, the metric system is used where you're looking at meters, grams, and liters, and using the Celsius temperature scale. All of the, the metric system is based on powers of 10. The other specific thing about units is they can vary. You can have a mass that can be correct, but listed in multiple different units. 1,000 grams is one kilogram. That is the same amount, but they are different units. And converting back and forth between units is something that is done in chemistry a lot, where you're going between grams and moles, which will be covered a little later, uh, milliliters and liters, grams and kilograms, milligrams to grams. You're converting a lot using the metric system. And the prefixes in front of the base unit name tell you the exact ratio of one unit to another. So you will use these many times both in the lab and the lecture course to convert between different units. When you take a measurement in a lab setting, you're also recording the numerical values. Uh, as I had just mentioned, you're going through and recording the value to that last digit, that educated guess of uh, significance. Different equipment can give you a different level of, of significance. So in the case of the videos that you'll watch uh, later, you have triple beam balances, which can give a precision of 0 0.01 grams, centigram balances giving precision of 0 0.001, and a digital analytical balance, which can give a precision of four decimal places out to 0 0.0001 grams. The different uh, instrument or different piece of equipment that you use to measure out something plays a role in the overall calculations that you're going to perform later on. You should always record the exact level of significance that the piece of equipment is giving you. If you have an analytical balance and it gives you a mass, one point one, five, six, seven grams. That is the number you record. You should be recording all of those digits. All of them are significant. They should never be rounded off uh, when you're recording. You just threw away the answer by cutting it off and rounding it. The other thing 
when you are recording data from an instrument or from a piece of equipment, you, uh, as I mentioned, you need to include all of the digits of significance. This also includes the zeros afterwards. If the balance reads exactly 1.5000 grams, this is what you should record. Each one of those digits are significant. By recording the zeros, this shows that that value is known all the way to that level of precision. If you were to record 1.5 grams only, that means it could be anywhere from 1.49, 1.51, anywhere in there. Uh, but by recording the zeros, the level of significance and that precision is known specifically. Um, there are rules when performing calculations, uh, when you're adding or subtracting, the significant figures go by the lowest number of decimal places. And when multiplying and dividing, the significant figures of the answer goes by the lowest total number of significant figures uh, of the two numbers you were used. Good rule of thumb for most uh, in lab settings when you're going through and actually doing some calculations, two to three decimal places is a very good uh, start. But in the lab course, there will never be any value that has less than two significant figures. So this uh, experiment is about density and measuring things in the lab. Density itself is based on two measured properties or two measured amounts, mass and volume. Uh, mass is, you. Uh, measured using scales or balances given in units of grams or kilograms. And as I had mentioned, there are different levels of precision to the different balances. There are small kitchen balances or the triple beam balances like will be shown uh, that have a level of precision out to two decimal places. And they cost a kitchen scale 20 bucks, not that expensive. However, there are precision digital microbalances that can measure a mass out to the nearest 0 0.0000001 grams. And these balances can cost well over $20,000. To give uh, to give the person that level of precision, that level of confidence that this is the exact number, the exact answer. Because some of these balances are rather expensive, you should always be weighing something in a container. Uh, you would never weigh a pile of salt directly on the kitchen scale. You would put it in some sort of a container. And by doing that, you would have the mass of the empty container, add the salt, and then by subtraction, you can obtain the mass of salt. In lab settings, this is also true. You would use either small beakers or weighing pans, weighing dishes, which are small containers of plastic that are disposable, or even weighing paper, which are just squares of wax paper. In the analogy I just put out with uh, the salt, that was weighing by difference. So the beam balances that can be used in some labs are manual. And many things can affect the actual sensitivity of that, things like temperature or humidity of the air. 
typically on an analytical balance that can be accounted for by pressing the tear button and zeroing the balance. So that way at the very beginning, it reads exactly zero to its appropriate level of, of significance. That way you can then place your empty container on it, obtain the mass, place your sample in the container, and subtract the two to weigh by difference and uh, obtain the mass. For these older beam balances, uh, because they're manual, there's usually a little dial on one end that you can turn, a little screw that will adjust it ever so slightly until the entire beam is level and balanced. But because that uh, can change based on temperature, humidity, and various other factors, that is very, very tedious. And weighing by difference in these cases can uh, be quite time-saving. Uh, time by measuring an empty container and obtaining the mass, adding what you want to measure inside the container and obtaining the combined mass and then subtracting the two, you can figure out the mass of what's in the container without uh, the error associated with it. Each of the, those two measurements, both the empty container and the combined container and mass will be off by some amount. But when you subtract them, the amount that it's off by, that error amount cancels and you're left with the correct uh, mass. The second uh, property or value that's being measured in this is volume. And volume can be a little bit trickier to measure, where using the mass, uh, you can have a solid, you can weigh it uh, in a container, or a liquid would definitely need an empty container, add the liquid, subtract the two to obtain the mass. To measure the volume, uh, there are two different ways that can generally be done based on the phase. So with a solid, if it's regularly shaped, you can use the geometry. You can use uh, distance measurements in three dimensions and use uh, the geometry to figure out what is the volume of that object. If it's the volume of a, of a cube, so that's length times width times, times height, all in the same unit. Something like a cylinder would be the area of the circle times the length of the cylinder. So the, for the area of the circle, it's pi r squared, and then times the length of the cylinder itself. Notice that each of these units, so in something that's length times width times height, the unit typically is centimeters. And when all three of these are multiplied together, centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, that would give a unit of centimeters cubed. Many times in hospital settings or in the medical field, you might hear them refer to CCs. This stands for cubic centimeters. And one cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter. When measuring the volume of liquids, they need to be in a container. Otherwise, they will spill everywhere. And there are different pieces of glassware in a lab that can hold these liquids depending on what you're actually going to be using it for. Uh, the cases of beakers and Erlenmeyer flasks, these are really just to hold the liquid. They do have some volume measurements on them, but they are very, very, very inaccurate. Uh, they are just for 
rough approximations and basically just not for precision level work. Um, really, if something has a wide base, if something is very wide, it's not going to give a very accurate volume reading based on the height. However, if it's very narrow, smaller changes in volume would give a higher or a, would give a longer distance of height, which can be measured more easily. And these are the cases in the, in, uh, the case of graduated cylinders and pipettes and burettes. They're tall and narrow, so that way small changes in volume uh, create a larger change in the height of the liquid in the container, which can be more accurately measured. Burettes and pipettes in particular have volumes that are read in more of a unique way. Burettes and pipettes are used to determine how much volume leaves this container. So you would fill a burette or a pipette, and when it's filled, the reading itself on the burette is zero. This does not mean that there is zero volume in the burette. This means that there has been zero milliliters that have left the burette. Uh, burettes and pipettes are designed to measure how much volume you add to another container very precisely. So in this case, uh, in the picture here, Zero is at the top, and as the volume is drained out the bottom, the volume level decreases, and it's left with 19.70 milliliters as the final volume reading. That means the volume that was added to the container below was final minus initial. 19.70 minus 0 0.00. This is why burettes are easier when you fill them up to the exact zero mark because that way the final volume is the answer or the final volume reading is the answer. Um, but it doesn't have to be. This volume could have started at exactly 18.00 and drained to this volume, to this uh, amount. That way, final minus initial would give a volume of 1.70 milliliters. With these glass pieces of equipment in lab, you can see that, or many times you can see that water in particular rides up the sides. It rides up the edges of these narrow containers. And this is referred to as the meniscus. So when you're looking at a scale and reading a volume level, you are looking at the bottom of the meniscus. You want to look straight on so that way it's even and you can look at exactly where the volume level is at the bottom of that uh, surface deviation. So in this experiment, you're looking at measuring mass and measuring volume in order to calculate density. Density itself is a ratio of mass over volume, where it's the mass that can be contained in one unit of volume. And this property is characteristic for pure substances. Copper will have the same density no matter how much copper you have. It will always be the same. Uh, in lab settings, again, you're measuring the mass in units of grams. You're measuring the volume in units of milliliters. 
And if the density is mass divided by volume, then the unit of density would be grams divided by milliliters or grams per milliliter. Um, as I said, you're taking a ratio or you're measuring these two me or taking these two measurements and the density is a ratio between these two. So as you go through this, you're going to be calculate, you're going to be measuring mass, you're going to be measuring volume, and you're going to be calculating the density of different objects. Measurements can have variability associated with them. By taking one measurement, recording it, and reweighing the same object again, the mass is slightly different. In labs, multiple measurements of the same object are made, and statistical calculations are performed on these to determine an average and correct value to the appropriate level of precision. When you perform a number of different uh, measurements, there can be statistical calculations that can be done to see what is the actual value. There are a number of things in a lab setting that cause a lot of variability. Uh, temperature, humidity, the fingerprint on the balance, these are things that can cause a little bit of deviation. So doing statistical calculations from a number of different measurements can give a more accurate uh, picture of the final value. So first off, some of the, the statistic calculations that you're going to be doing in the course, you're going to calculate the average. So that would just be taking multiple measurements, adding them all together, and dividing by how many measurements you actually had taken. So you're looking to see the sum of all of your measurements of the same thing, divide it by how many measurements uh, you actually have taken. And that will give you one average value. Deviation is something that is specific for each trial. You're looking to see how far away from the average are your individual trials. So trial one, in this case, the average value was 4.676 grams. Trial one is slightly smaller than that value. That, we, that means the deviation of trial number one is negative 0.007 grams. It is less than the average. Deviations themselves, or these individual deviations of multiple trials, can be either positive or negative. But in either case, you should always include the unit itself. These are deviations of grams. So when performing a measurement or even uh, performing these calculations, the units carry through throughout the entire uh, throughout all of the calculations that's also true in the average deviation so when you have uh, the individual deviations the average deviation is very similar to what it sounds like you're summing together all of these individual deviations and taking an average however you're looking to see um, the variability of your answer. So you've taken, in this example, three measurements. Some are off in the negative direction. Some are off in the positive direction. The variability 
can go in either direction. And so to take the average deviation, you are looking at the absolute value, the average of the absolute value number. So negative 0 0.007 just is positive 0 0.007. Positive 0 0.036 is positive 0 0.036, and so on. And you take these positive numbers and obtain an average. In this case, 0 0.024 grams, the average deviation is plus or minus 0 0.024. That's the variability. That is. Uh, approximately where the mass ends up being. It, the average is 4.676 grams plus or minus one, or I'm sorry, plus or minus 0 0.024 grams. So the actual value would be within that range. The, you're accounting for the variability. The last calculation or the last statistical measurement is the percent error. And this is something that you can only do if you know the true value, if you know the actual theoretical number. Uh, in many cases, if you have an unknown, it's an unknown. You don't know what the correct answer is, so you can't get a percent error. But if you do know the correct answer, you can figure out how far off is your measured value versus the correct value. And to do that, the percent error is the measured value minus the true value, all divided by the true value times 100%. So in the example that I ju had just went through, I measured an average value of 4.676 grams, but let's say the true theoretical actual value is 4.660 grams. They are not identical. There is a small amount of error associated with that. And this is to show how close you are to the correct value. So with the average deviation, this is giving the level of precision, how close your measurements are, and with the percent error, you're given the accuracy, how close to the actual correct value are you. The property of mass is measured using balances or scales. These different types of balances can measure the mass of a substance up to a differing level of precision. Beam balances such as these can only measure uh, the mass out to a range of 0.01 or 0.001 grams while digital analytical balances can measure the mass out to four decimal places and give a higher level of precision. In performing measurements on pieces of equipment with different levels of precision, the overall calculated answer will also have different levels of precision. In the video that you'll watch, you will see an unknown liquid be weighed on different uh, balances, each with a different level of precision, and the volume also be measured with different pieces of equipment that have different levels of precision. So in this first part of the experiment, you're looking at how it's measured uh, what different pieces of equipment or different pieces of glassware are used to measure the density, what is used to measure the mass, and calculate the density based on these levels of precision.
beam balances are used by balancing the mass on one side with the mass on the other using predetermined individual weights. Starting at a mass of zero, the object to be weighed is placed on the pan. This causes an imbalance between the two sides. To record the mass of the object, the masses are moved incrementally starting with the heaviest. At a mass of 100 grams, the object is still not balanced, indicating that it weighs more than 100 grams. If the weight is moved to the next increment, the beam balance drops, indicating that 200 grams is more than the weight of the object. The mass of the object weighs between 100 and 200 grams. The same procedure is done with the next weight. The beaker weighs more than 10 grams, but less than 20 grams. The last mass to move on a beam balance is on the front of the balance and is on a sliding scale. The mass itself is moved along until the object reaches the zero mark and is level. Because the last measurement is performed on a sliding scale, you can read between scale divisions to estimate between the marks. Overall, the mass of this beaker would weigh 114.09 grams. The mass of the 100 weight, the mass of the 10 weight, and the mass on the sliding scale combined. Overall, the object is perfectly balanced. The next part of the experiment focuses on the use of beam balances and physical measurements of an unknown solid. In your unknown files, you're given pictures of an unknown solid uh, up to a ruler. These are cylinders, and you're looking to, at measuring, using the ruler in the picture, the diameter and the radius of the cylinder and the length. From that, using geometry, you can obtain the volume of that cylinder. The mass is then you uh, provide it based on pictures of a beam balance. So first off, as mentioned previously, you should be using, uh, when you weigh something on a balance, placing it in a container first. And the empty beaker file on Blackboard lists what in, uh, through pictures what the mass of that empty beaker is using the beam balance. With beam balances, how these are used is they're literal balances. You are trying to balance one side versus the other. And so by placing a mass on one side, it is no longer balanced. You would be slowly moving masses towards the other end in order for it to equal and be balanced. You generally always want to start with the highest uh, mass first. In most of these, it's the hundreds place, uh, though none of these um, masses actually weigh more than 100 grams. So after seeing that, moving on to the tens place, in this example, when the tens mass is at 60, the beam balance is up. This is underbalanced. There is more mass on the other side than there is on this side. But if you move this weight by one more uh, place, the beam drops down to the bottom. 
now it's overbalanced. There is too much weight on this side and not enough on the other side. What that means is the mass is somewhere in between 60 and 70 grams. Next, the same thing is done using the ones place. And at six grams, it's underbalanced, but at seven, it's overbalanced. That means the mass is between 66 and 67. It was more than 60, but less than 70. And 60 plus six, and it's more than 66. 60 plus seven, less than 67. The last part of the of a beam balance is a sliding scale on the front. And you take one of these masses and just move it along until the beam becomes exactly balanced. The line on the beam itself matches up with the zero mark. And that way you know that it's perfectly balanced on one side versus the other. In this example, I would estimate this as 66.548 grams, but again, the eight is my educated guess. It could be a little more than that, it could be a little less than that. However, it is between these two markings. So you know it is more than 66.55, but less than 66. 0.56. At home, you're going to be estimating the mass of a book by measuring the volume and using the density in order to calculate the mass. Choosing any paperback book, you'll measure the different dimensions of the book with a ruler and using the geometry, you can figure out what the volume of the book is, and using the density of paper, estimate what the mass is. You need to use a fully paperback book, as the thickness of the front cover would play a role in estimating the mass. This portion, again, is an at-home experiment. You're looking to see the dent or looking at the density of a soft cover book. So you're going to use uh, any paperback book that you have at home. It can be a novel, it can be this amazing lab manual right here, or it can be a cookbook or something along those lines. It really doesn't matter. It should not be a hardcover book. The hardcover books, the, uh, the covers themselves, those are cardboard, and they have a different density than uh, the rest of the paper inside. Most paperback books, while the cover is a little thicker, uh, it doesn't make up that much of, uh, of a difference. So what you're going to do is you're going to measure the, vo the volume of your book by using either a ruler or a ruler app and measuring the length, the width, and the height of this book to obtain the volume. Then you'll use the standard density of paper, 1.201 grams per cubic centimeter. That is the standard density of most, uh, most papers, computer paper, copy paper. And you'll calculate what is the mass of your actual book. Uh, in the end, it would also be, we're also asking you to attach a picture of the book that you're actually using. On the Wikipedia page, you're, going, you're looking at the relationship of density and temperature uh, for water, the pure substance of water. So on the uh, Wikipedia page for density, towards uh, kind of the middle, you're looking at um, the density of water section, there is a table. You're going to graph that data on Wikipedia. You're using 
temperature on the x-axis and density on the y-axis. Um, while density is a physical property, it's based on two measured values, mass and volume. Increasing or changing the temperature, typically um, it will not change the mass. However, the volume is how much space something takes up. And by increasing the temperature, you're increasing the amount of energy that are in those molecules. And now they have a little more energy. They're moving around a little bit more. They want to be farther apart. And usually the volume increases. And by the volume increasing, or at least changing, and the temp uh, mass staying constant, that means the overall density is also changing as a function of temperature. The last part of this experiment is uh, calculating statistics based on a set of data. In your unknown file, there is a table of mass and volume measurements for an unknown metal sample. From those measurements, you're going to calculate in each of the four, uh, the four trials, what is the density of each of those four trials. And from those four density values, you will calculate the average, the deviation for each trial, the, and the average deviation. Based on that, you can look to see and match what would be the identity of that unknown metal based on the density. Once you've identified what you believe the metal sample is, you're going to use the correct density value, the theoretical true density value for these metals, which are given here, to calculate a percent error. Overall, this experiment looks at the measured properties of volume and mass and determines the calculated property of density. All of this looks at the different units associated with the different measurements, as well as the different levels of precision that different instruments can measure.